house tonight, isn't there? <laughs> yes. Started with 8 o'clock prayer. Um, if you were here, it was, um, it just started, just really, just started off so well. Um, who was here for Scott this morning? Wow. That was, um, that was really good stuff, too. How are you, I mean, how are you guys doing, man? All right, yeah, all right, I'll talk to Ari. I, I, this is like blanks, blank out there. I got some really light lights. Can't see you guys that well, but I'm trying to see how you guys are doing out there. See if I can stem out of these lights. How are you doing? Val, I know you are. Man, that was fun worshiping with you tonight, man. That was pretty good. Hmm. can't tell if we have expectation in the house or we're just uh, what we call spiritually drunk. <laughs> Probably a combination of both, huh? We're on part two of uh, Kingdom of Heaven series. Um, did part one a couple of weeks ago and started off, um, a little bit, I'll start off where the same place, uh, Revelations 1. And this is what John says. Um, Hmm. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And so the series is, is really kingdom of heaven, who was, who is, and who is uh, to come. And, and the, the hope is to, um, to provide some perspective on, on Father God who was last week, Father God who is today, and Father God who is to come um, in the next age. And we started off with Genesis 1, um, and just uh, kind of get us framed out who this God is anyway. anyway. And Genesis 1 says this, um, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and hell. Oh, it doesn't say that? Oh. Oh. Darn. Did I miss something there? Oh. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, got it right. And we, um, where's the heavens thing? Where's that heavens? Is it up there? Oh, can we turn down the lights a little bit? Look at this, man. I just soon preach like this the rest of the night. In the beginning. Jeepers. You know, the worship team, Lisa, um, Dave, and the crew, um, thank you. We talked about in the beginning of what? It's interesting, he says, in the beginning, not at the beginning. In the beginning, in the Hebrew, signifies a circular in the beginning, in the beginning of a circle. That's kind of cool. So at the beginning is at the beginning of something. In the beginning is actually the beginning of a circle that has no beginning and has no end, which is kind of a neat little thought. We know somebody like that, right? We talked about um, some scientific stuff. Um, Stephen Hawking, before he died, made a statement something along the lines of, um, in their earlier years as a scientist, if you don't know, Stephen Hawking is one of the most uh, well-known, uh, I guess it's string theory. I mean, one of those one of well-known uh, physicists in the history of uh, the world. And he made the statement, in the early part of my career, it was taboo to talk about time travel. He said this. He says, if you talked about time travel as a, phys as a f physics, physicist, phys 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 as a physicist, phys 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 You are a crank. Now, I don't know what that is. I don't know what a crank is. But he said, if you were, if in the early days, if you talked about time travel, you were a crank. But now, we're actually talking about it openly, which means they're starting to get into some of the secrets. And Bill hit on this a few weeks ago on the, um, on the Tower of Babel, some of the secrets that God is using in the physical laws of the universe. He talked, I, I, I talked about, um, um, what, are the, what are those holes? Um, you know, wormholes. Black holes, right? Science is really onto this stuff. There's this thing called cosmic strings. 
they think, in time, time travel, where t cosmic strings are actually like this circular thing that um, they, they think has a secret to time. They talk about, they theorize that the speed of light, which is 186,000 feet per second, at actually at the speed of light, time stops. 180, what did I say, feet per second? I was trying to help the Lord out here, make it a little more uh, understandable. All right, 186,000 miles per second, you're right. I probably said, I hope I said miles per second last week. Oh, real good, right? And then they say this, but nothing travels at 186,000 miles per second, so they can't tell if actually time stops. But meanwhile, what they said is light travels at 186,000 miles, miles per second. <laughs> this fascinates, this stuff fascinates me. I don't know if it fascinates you. What I want to, what I'm proposing, what I'm, what I'm asking us in this series to start considering is heaven's perspective, and let's just narrow it down to our lives. Let's not worry about the next guy's life. I'm not going to, you know, think about heaven's perspective today with about Robin's life or Hannah's life, Scott's life, my friend's life. See, I want to, I want to, I want to start with heaven's perspective on my life, on any circumstances I find myself in, on my assignment, on my tasks at hand, on my sleep, on my awake hours, on my work hours, on my play hours. What is heaven's perspective? And when I start considering God who created heaven and earth, and I start thinking about God's perspective on all of my circumstances, not a few of them, not the easier ones, not the ones that aren't trying to stress me out. In particular, if I can, if I can start, if I start feeling a circumstance is getting away from me, if you and I start thinking, I'm going to get rid of the my and say our. If we can start as, as, a, as, a, as a group of people, of believers, and start considering the circumstances that we feel like are really kind of out of our grasp for either understanding or handling or dealing with or fixing, and our first move is in, Father, what is your perspective? I can, I think I can say this boldly. I promise a shift away from worry and into faith and trust. See, this was Father God in the beginning, and he was the beginning, creating the heavens and the earth. He's been around for a while. Last week we talked about he's not stressing about our situations. He hasn't put us on this earth to stress about your situations he hasn't put us on this earth to stress about the people around you and me. It's not part of his DNA. He's not stressed about it. He's not up there saying, hmm, that's a pretty big problem you got there. I don't know what you're going to do about that. You, yeah, good luck to you. You need to get some help somewhere. Anybody up here want to give him a hand, give her a hand? No. This is last week. The, the, the couple points of last week, last week, primary point is God is not stressed about our stuff. Not worried about it. Let's go Jesus. Yeah. Let's look at this guy. Bill Vanderbush put a bunch of pictures up there uh, a few weeks ago that um, look just a little bit more stressed out than this guy looks. I kind of vision this was Jesus right after they tried to throw him off a cliff. He slipped through the crowd, found some kids. That's such a good picture, man. We talked about last week, how many of us kind of want to be uh, this little guy right here? He's got the good spot. If we think about some circumstances that are trying in our life, can we think about, hey, let's just sit right there in that spot. Look how Jesus is looking at him. Hey, man, what do you got going on there? I got gotcha. you. Let's leave that up for a few minutes. Tonight we're going to talk about heaven's perspective, what is, 
I'm going to go back to a set of uh, scriptures that we ended off with. Jesus walked in heaven's perspective. He walked in passionate peace. He walked with healing hands, not war warrior hands. We talked last week about lowering our hands. Instead of being up here ready to roll, we talked about brawling. Concept, if we get bumped from behind, whether it's friend or enemy, we turn to strike because we can't tell the difference between a friend and an enemy because we're in a brawl mentality, right? So we feel a nudge. We feel a bump. We feel an attack. And our inclination, because we're in a brawl mentality, is to turn and strike. Jesus walked with his hands down. He walked with healing's hands, not war hands. He knew that God had his back. He wasn't really, we're going to read about this in a couple of minutes. He wasn't really worried about these guys. Jesus refused the bait of Satan. <clears throat> Man. You know, all the time that he's leading with passionate peace, leading with healing hands, not war hands, not taking the bait Satan keeps throwing out there in our path. He didn't lead by fear. He still made tough calls and tough statements. We're gonna, let's, let's get into one of these right now. Let's go, to, um, let's go to Luke 4. This is a really fun run of scripture. This is where we ended up last week. It's easy to focus on the first part of this scripture, um, but it's not really what caught my attention um, over the last year or two. 418, now let's start a little bit earlier. So he goes to Nazareth, his own town, right? Where he had been brought up and was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And as he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he opened up the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives, the recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I can almost promise you, if you go to any church in America, in the course of one year, there will be a sermon on that run of scripture somewhere. We're going to bring it up. It's brilliant stuff. Man. Yes, he did. Yes, he was. But what's, been catch, what's really been catching my eye is the rest of the story. He closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. This is pretty neat. Now he's speaking in his own hometown. And they marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. I, it's hard for me to wrap my hands around that. My, I mean, he's from there. I mean, are you saying he didn't have gracious words before? I don't know if he did. It's a mystery to me. The story doesn't stop. And he said to him, to them, you surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have done, heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, now this is after his gracious words. This is the guy who is uh, um, leading with uh, peace. This doesn't sound peaceful to me. This is pretty straight talk. We're going to get into this straight talk. But truly I said to you, many widows who were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many leopards were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. So then, all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, not the gracious things, these things, they rose up, thrust him out of the city, led him to the brow of a hill in which their city was built, that they might throw him down off the cliff. <laughs> a 
The point of last week I made was then passing through the midst of him, he went his way. Even though after giving some tough talk, after, after really making a very difficult point that he was making to them and us that wasn't popularly received, even them when they were about to throw him off the cliff, how did he respond? He didn't go to blows. I don't see any more attack. He just went on his way. I want to look a little bit today on exactly what it was he was saying. Let's talk a little bit about Zarephath. So she was in the region of Sidon, and, it's in, and notice it's in Elijah's time. You know who else was from the region of Sidon in Elijah's time? Who the queen of Sidon was? Jezebel. She's a Phoenician. We're talking about Phoenicians. Modern-day Lebanon. Jesus was saying to the Israelites that, guess what? In the days of Jezebel, like Jezebel, I healed her when you didn't get healed. <laughs> That's pretty funny. They didn't like to hear that. Why do you think they were mad? Do we even understand why he was mad? I mean, do we ever stop to think, well, why'd they get mad about that? Well, because Jesus knows what he's talking about. He knows about Sidon in Elijah's time. And then he brings up Naaman. You know who Naaman was? He was the commander of the army of Syria in about 720 B.C. who was picking on Israel. I don't know. Syria shows up in the Bible somewhere around 800 B.C., somewhere in there, right? Um, before that, they're, they're kind of a um, nomadic people. And from 800 B.C. right up through modern day, there's a lot of adversarial stuff going on between Israel and Syria. Naaman, <laughs> when he got healed, do you know how he got healed? He captured an Israel girl and made her a slave. He was a, who's, a, who's the name of the king? I think I have it written down. He was the captain of King Aram, 732 B.C., at war with Israel. He sneaks his guys into Israel, takes a girl captive, takes him home, and makes her a slave to his wife. And this slave girl says to his wife, hey, I know somebody that can heal your husband. Oh, boy. Heaven's perspective. I'm hoping we're going to start tracking here a little bit. The slave girl, taken from her home, ripped from her home, in a time of nastiness, made a slave, tells the wife of her captor, the slaveholder, I know somebody that can heal him. What was Jesus saying? couple points I want to make tonight, and we're going to go through some scriptures. Can we get El Baghdadi up there? Um, let's fast forward just a little bit to Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Father, um, let your name be glorified well tonight. This is not an easy point I'm trying to make here, so bear with me. You know who this guy is? This is al-Baghdadi. He's the guy that founded the army called um, the Islamic State or ISIS. He's been listed on America's number one man to kill for a long time. He got wounded, I think, in February. I'm not sure if we know whether he's, he's gone or not. Probably most Americans would say that, boy, this guy needs to be dead because of the stuff that he, um, honey, exactly right. Man, I mean, I don't know if you caught what Scott's been preaching on for the last couple of weeks, but did you hear how that offended her? Now, I'm a soldier, as you know. I'm not saying that we probably shouldn't have tried to take this guy out. But I am saying I don't want it. That's not my first choice. I want to read a story about another guy. Let's go to Acts 9. Then Saul, 
still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Now, at the time, I think the high priest was still Caiaphas, right? We're in the transition when Caiaphas, I think, was in here for another four or five years. Caiaphas oversaw the trial of Jesus along with his father-in-law, Annas. Annas had retired from high priest, but he was still very influential. Annas and Caiaphas were still the ones just a few chapters ago that were trying to take out Peter and John, right? Letters from the, um, from the religious people. This man here is a very religious man. If anybody doesn't believe it, I, I think this man really believes what he believes. He believes he's in the right. How can you do the things he's doing if you don't think you're in the right? So that if any who are in the way, this is Jesus' people, believers, whether men or women, notice it left out children, but in the day, if you read your history, children were also. He might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You know what they were doing in Jerusalem? Putting them on trial, turning them over to the Romans for their fun. Coliseum stuff, right? Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. I um. We could. There's a lot of different directions we can go here, but I want to focus on one thing. I want to focus on Paul the apostle, who this man turned into being. I want to um give heaven's perspective on our lives today and our approach to um, overall life. When we see adversaries, see God, there's a, God is a, God's weird man. He, he, he just sees people differently. He just, he just, he sees this man as a son. I don't know how he does it. I mean, I don't see, maybe you do. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'm way out on a limb. I, last week, I'll just, if you weren't here, I said, I'm, I'm going to take some freedoms in these next three weeks to be like a pitcher throwing pitches across the plate, and you've got to be a catcher framing some things. I'm going to, I might throw some balls off the plate that are balls, and you got to frame them in and bring them in a strike. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my very best. But I don't see myself any difference between this man and Saul of Tarsus. What's that? Oh, what did I say? Oh, okay. Does there, does there, does there, you know what I'm talking about with a battery? Pitchers pitch balls and strikes, correct? We know that much. Catchers... They get back there, and their job is to locate pitches, and if they're off the plate, they get their arm out here just a little bit, catch the ball right here, and they frame it inside. They call it framing the pitch. So that when they do that, if they do it well enough, the umpire goes strike, when really it was ball, right? So I'm, I might throw some things across the middle of the plate, but I'm, I'm brushing the plate on some things in this next couple of weeks. I'm, I'm, I want to open up the house to understanding on some things. One of the things I want to open up the house to is that our understanding is not complete. We, we, there's, heaven's perspective is, is, when we're aligning with heaven's perspective, one of the keys is that our perspective is not 100%. Jesus said, Jesus, <laughs> Right? There's, there's understanding. God is pouring out understanding. Jesus made this comment to the disciples. There's many more things I want to tell you, but you're not ready yet. But someday we're going to be ready. Someday, today, yesterday, maybe next week, there's things that we, you and I are going to be ready for. As we mature, we're ready for more. And if we think our understanding is in a place where we've got it down, 
we're, we're, we're going to miss some understanding that it's key for us to get, not just for our maturity, but to, to really carry what it is that we're, well, as, especially as, as people and as a house, to actually do the things that Scott was articulating this morning. Far out? What I believe Jesus was correcting was this concept that is, the people of Israel were actually God's mercenaries. They weren't his mercenaries. They were his missionaries. This wasn't a set-up thing where I'm in this club over here, and everybody that's not in this club here is out of the club. Jesus was fixing that. Jesus was actually saying this lady who came from the city of Jezebel, who was of that Jezebelian line and heritage, I healed. This man who was murdering my people, my children, I called and he responded. This captain of this war captain, this warrior that was taking my people prisoners and killing my people, I healed. It's important for us to understand this as Jesus believers today. The, compa the, the comparison is, to me, is almost perfect. It is why we do I matter. But I matter at the house, that's cool. Scott and I said that one of the things we said this morning is without it, man, I, I don't, I'm not out. I don't know what I am. Yeah, Scott said, if I, we just agreed this morning, if he wasn't doing it, I'd still be doing it. If I wasn't doing it, he'd still be doing it. Why? It's the same thing with Manny and Sherry leading these houses. There's a component to heaven's perspective today that in church is so important that we hear this, that, that this, this, this collection here is incredibly important. The sweetness of today I, and it was first service worship. The, the prayer opened some things up. Worship started, and I saw heaven open up this morning in here. Corporate worship, corporate prayer, corporate unity. Man, I'm not downplaying that. Jesus wasn't downplaying that. He, wasn't, he was accustomed to being in the synagogue. Super important. We, this is where we learn, we fellowship, we unite. But this isn't a club. This isn't exclusionary. Scott made a point this morning. I don't know if we can get our arms around this. You believe, you belong before you believe. What? No. You have to believe first. Not what Jesus said. Man, if this is coming across, we're talking at. Man, I hope that's not happening. I'm, I'm so convicted. I don't know where my, I'm on my note. This guy, Paul, I think he... Um, I think the reason why, I mean, first of all, even picking Paul is, I mean, where'd you go? Where'd El Baghdadi go? We'll switch it back to Jesus in a minute. Even picking him, I mean, is ridiculous. It's weird. Can you imagine how that must have stuck in the craw of the disciples? What are you doing? What? What? What are you doing? Ananias said that. Uh, what? What? You want me to have Al Baghdadi over for dinner? You know I'm a Jesus guy, right? Probably going to come up. You know he kills the Jesus people. What am I supposed to do? My religion tells me I can't deny you, so you're sending my murderer to my house. Thanks a lot.
Part two. Tonight. I don't know if this is, I'm, Father, let this go. For he is my chosen vessel to bear my name before Gentiles, those out of the club, kings, those out of the club, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Um, that's heaven's perspective in the now. Well, wait a minute, God. I'm a son of God, a child of the Most High God. I have all these rights and privileges, promises. Why am I suffering? Can't be right. See, I don't know when we're um. This is this is a, this is the this is the starting line up in here, right? Um. So here's a gift. When we're ministering, heaven's heaven's perspective is pretty important. Did what would happen if Ananias, when Paul went in there, he said, uh, "Hey, you know, you're in the club now. I don't get it. But guess what? That suffering you're going through isn't right." Heaven's perspective will help us walk through that. I thank God for people who stand with me, who speak truth, say, Dave, what you're going through, that isn't right. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about all suffering. What allows us to do a little bit, I think, is have heaven's perspective in some of our suffering. What's neat about this is I know that we're suffering in some respects. I know probably, I mean, each of us, if we, I know there's some suffering going on. As a, as a prophetic guy, as a, as a, as a, as a pastoral arm, as, as, a, as a man, as a son of God, it's super important for us to look for heaven's perspective in these things. Today, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know how many of you guys prayed for it today, but there is, there is some great healing again today, dude. I mean, just today. Um, right after the second service, I don't, I don't know how many people got healed. But what it takes us, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, three, four, five that I know of, right? Um, but it took going for a root, not symptom. See what I'm saying? You're picking up where I'm at, heaven's perspective? Maybe. <laughs> what was Paul's job? What was his assignment? <laughs> yeah. Hey, we can get this guy down now. Let's put Jesus back up. Yeah. All right. We're at we're in the after now. <laughs> well done. Gentiles, kings, children of Israel. You know that my own personal opinion is part of the reason why Paul was chosen is because he had a capacity to not accept what I'm going to call is hypocrisy in his own life. God knew, my opinion, that when he nabbed Paul, he was getting one passionate individual, a zealot, that needed some Jesus. And once he got Jesus and some training and equipping over about 10 to 12 years, this man had an ability to see beyond bigotry that others in the day just never quite could get beyond. 
We know this when we talk about Galatians 2, even Peter. This is, Galatians 2 is written 57 AD, 25 years into this thing. Right? Even, you know, Peter, even God had to go to Peter, what you, what I call clean. What do you think he was talking about? Pigs? I think so. See, if, if, our, if we can take our perspective and just refuse a lie that calls things unclean that God calls clean. And here's the thing. I understand the scripture they'll know by the fruit. I get that. But that's not an eternal thing. That's a discernment thing. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to be able to see fruit, and I'm interacting with people outside the doors and in the doors, and that fruit is giving me discernment on roots of how I can go, at, how I can go after it and lead people to righteousness. It is not for putting up a wall. It's not for shunning. Super, see, wait till you get into next week. Next week we're going to do what is it come. This is, this is, I mean, I don't, I don't know how this is, I really don't know how this is going to be received. Remember last week, one of the things we talked about is there's a revelation that comes, um, comes and we all love this. I mean, there's, there's nothing like revelation that changes our DNA, our spiritual DNA, or arrange it in such a way where now we're lined up with the kingdom of heaven in such a way that before that revelation hit and our spirit took hold of it and altered our, our approach to life, we were a different person. So now I was this, revelation hits, on time, not late. I didn't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sitting in judgment before that. We're going to read that in a minute. Acts 17, where Vanderbush was trying to go to and never quite got to the other night, a few weeks ago, right? But revelation hits. I hear revelation. My spirit man says, yes, that is actually right. I have known that somewhere in there, but I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't mature enough to handle it. Or for whatever reason, Father hadn't released it yet into my spirit where I can say yes and amen to that. And now, although I hear that now, oh, now it's yes and amen. I can step into this, and that person here is not who I am anymore. This, this I, I pray, is a, an act of perpetuity. I, I pray that each one of us almost don't recognize each other week to week to week to week to week to week to week. I pray that through, in familiarity, my wife just, man, I don't, who's this guy? Yeah. Let's go to Acts 17. Pretty neat little story. We don't want to start. 16. Now, Paul waited for them in Athens. Let's talk about Athens. Where's Athens? Who are the Greeks? Yeah. We, historical context is really important. Do you know who else was a Greek? It's a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes is the only person ever to take Israel that, that tried to outlaw the Hebrew religion. And he killed something like 80,000 people in a short period of time. If you were a priest, you were a dead man. The Maccabean revolt started because he heard about a priest up in the hills, and Antiochus sent some people up in the hills to say, hey, are you still Hebrew or not? And they said, yeah, and they killed all his emissaries. Started the Maccabean revolt, Hanukkah. That's not that long before this, a couple hundred years. The American Revolution. Not long ago. The Greeks. Ever heard of Alexander the Great? It was a Greek. Philip, Macedon, Macedonia, Greece. Conquerors, killers. Here's Paul in Greece. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers. That's pretty funny. <laughs> hey, man. Okay. This is, this is what I'm hearing. I'm going into Walmart. 
This is where Paul went into. He went into the synagogue with Jews and Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. And he reasoned with them. And a certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Paul's Paul in there starting to reason with these guys, and these very smart people say, what is this guy talking about? Call him a babbler. It's pretty funny. And they took him and brought him to Areopagus. I, I knew how to say this today. Areopagus, there we go, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is you speak. This is also pretty cool. For you are bringing something strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know these things mean. This is, this is what, yeah, this is all we ask for when we're out there. Paul's got him on a silver platter. This is all we can hope for. Yeah, oh, you want to know. If, if, if we're walking outside these walls with our heads and eyes up for Greeks, man, somebody, does somebody want to talk to me? Does anybody here want what I have? I love the way Bill did this. Walking around looking for someone who wants to draw the anointing that I carry, that you carry. Come on, man. Who was, who is. Friends, it's too easy in our society to get tunnel vision. Me too, man. Can we walk, man, like a, I don't know, I almost want to say a predator, a Jesus predator. Is there such a thing? There's got to be another word. Somebody come up with a better word from that. Can I, yeah, like a lion of the tribe of Judah, man, of the land, yeah, just, okay, who wants what I got? Come get some. <laughs> we do this because we know what we carry. We don't think we know what we carry. We don't have a clue. We don't have this. We want to try this. I know what he is, what he, uh, he does through me, I know will change your life forever for the glory of the Most High. It's all Paul's doing. Who wants some? To these Greeks 200 years ago trying to stamp out his entire nation. Oops. Aha. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or hear something new. Man, he's got a ripe crowd here. Then Paul stood up in the midst of the, in the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you are very religious. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, him I proclaim to you. I, I mean, he's meeting them where he's at, where they're at. He's like, hey, you idiots. Who wasn't doing that? God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell all on the face of the earth. And has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So that they... <laughs> so that they should seek the Lord in hope, and they may find, they might, ha. So they should seek the Lord in the hope that they may grope for him and find him, though he is not far off from each and every one of us. Do you know everybody that we walk across is in that same exact position? Every single person. I don't care what they proclaim. They're seeking something. It's in the nature of man. 
what is going on. What is going on? I don't care if we get intimate with people, if we get in relationship with people that we consider outside, on the outside, not of our assignment, but on the outside of the kingdom. Because it, just because you're on the outside of the kingdom doesn't mean you're on the outside of the assignment. Right? I'm telling you, eventually, when they trust you and I, they're going to let on that they're seeking in the growth that at some point they might discover something. Though he is not far from each one of us. And he's telling this group of people that God is not far from them. For in him we live and move and have our being. And also have, also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. I'm going to close with these couple of things here and we'll move on to the last. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the divine nature as like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. devising. Listen to what he says here. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. Huh. Who's Paul to tell the people that their ignorance God overlooked? That's a tough message. But now, <laughs> this is the fun part. But now, now you got me. Oh, who are you? I'm a son. But now, you got me. And he commands all men to repentance. What does I matter? Why are we doing it? Why do we walk out of the house into our jobs? Why is our pull outside those doors? Hmm. To be the conduit to introduction to the Most High God. Repentance, yes. Takes a lot of shapes and a lot of forms. Super good. Wait a minute. You're supposed to say that. I am um, I'm convinced that Paul had no idea the impact that he was having on the planet. Let's go, uh, let's go. Man, look at this guy. Man, I love that guy. Paul was just about his job. That's all he did. Led by the Spirit. I don't think he worried too much about who was going with him. Bro. There's an interesting um, historical reality to the time that, that Jesus walked in. Within 300 years through the ministry of Paul, who was al-Baghdadi before Paul, as far as I'm concerned. Listen to the names of the people groups. Egyptians, Philistines, Assyrians, Hittites, Moabites, Babylonians, Phoenicians, Persians, Medes, Greeks, Romans. Do you have any idea how many of those in the people group Israel thought they were adversarial with? All of them. We start, we, we mentioned last week this thing way, way back in Joshua 5. This is where the <laughs> scripture is so stinking cool, man. Way back. In Joshua 5, Joshua going to Jericho meets a stranger on a road 
draws us who's got a sword drawn standing in his path and this tough guy says you for us or against us i mean I, I i don't know any other reason for the word other than the answer that you get you give is going to be how i respond right this is a declaration of peace or war and the the, the answer came neither i wonder if josh i wonder how many times joshua thought about that Wait a minute. Not only neither, and then he's going to tell them how to take out the people that he wasn't adversarial with. We, um, and today, I, I feel like, um, and this is a little bit of um, what is and what, what is to come and now is. We have a magnificent opportunity, church, to, to remove dividers when i see assyrians and moabites and hittites i see the people groups in our nation in our world that cause division that we 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 for some reason find a way to have division with all kinds of racial stuff all kinds of sexist stuff all kinds of this you know um lifestyle stuff all kinds of, um, I even wrote some of this stuff down. Status, religion, those Mormons, those Jehovah's Witnesses, those Muslims. Man, do we, do we, do we begin to see heaven's perspective on these things? Right? Do you know even after Paul died, the impact that Rome had on the gospel because of his, him being a Roman? This is kind of the point. If, you, if, if we can get this, bro, um, there will be a thousand of bricks lifted off. If, if, if this point can get, get, if we can get this point, a thousand of bricks come off. And I don't know if I don't know if I can I don't know if I can bring it. After Paul was gone, Armenians, the Celts, the Franks, the Anglo's, the Saxons, the Germans, and even the Vikings. We think Rome fell in 400 A.D., but it really didn't. I mean, it extended right up until 1100. Rome turned to Christianity under Constantine. Reflecting of an obedient guy that God said, I will show him all he must suffer who just went about his day never knowing the impact that God had for the world because of his work. If in the heaven's perspective for today, if um, if if our approach to the day is Father, what's your perspective? Now, Je Jesus did some tough stuff, man. I'm not saying just do nothing. I'm saying that. We'll hear that. But I think it's important that we understand and walk with an element of peace. And, it's, and it really has to start individually. That God's mind towards us is he knows the thoughts that he has towards us. The thoughts of peace and not evil the thoughts to give you a future and a hope. And you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. When you search with me for all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all nations 
and from all places where I've driven you. It's an interesting little deal here. God, this is, God's pretty cool, man. He does this, you know, through freedom or through captivity. He's going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish. Through our freedom or through our captivity. Think Daniel wanted to go to Babylon? <laughs> I'm going to close. If everybody in the sound of, of, um, of my voice can, boy, I hope, I just, Father, again, Lord, let your name be represented well. Father, I just pray, speak to hearts, Father, in purity. Lord, I just ask you to perfect the spoken word, Lord, into the ears as only you can. Lord, speak to the hearts even only as you can, God. Father, I pray heaven's perspective, your perspective, dominate our perspective. Man, Jesus said this. Surely I say to you, whatever, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what are we worried about? What's stirring us up? What we do? That? We did a bunch of that this morning. I want to encourage you to um, begin to practice that. When you're feeling stress, stress in Jesus' name, I bind you. F trust in Jesus' name, I release you. Anger in Jesus' name, I bind you. Peace in Jesus' name, I loose you. Lack of prosperity in Jesus' name, I bind you. Abundance. In Jesus' name, I lose you. Do it as a son of the Most High, a daughter of the Most High God, man. This isn't like, hey, let's just try this. Try not, says Yoda. Do. Do, do, or do not. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask. Now, this is an interesting little thing here. We didn't touch on it much this morning. Listen to what he says here. I say to you that if two of you, two of you agree on anything that they ask. Well, who's the they? I don't know. You read what he's talking about before this. There's some pretty neat, um, pretty neat little authority going on here. We've been talking about this for a while. Prayer, I think, um, you know, present fullness, future completion. Um, we, we, um, there's a, there's a prayer, a prayer, prayer plateau that we're. <laughs> it would be good to. Climb to. <laughs> Is that gentle? I remain convinced that, that we, me, you, keep asking God to do things he's given us authority to do, and he's not taking it back. So we keep saying, Father, will you? And he's saying, no. Listen, he did that. Jesus said before, feed them. You do it. You know, Jesus isn't saying when he says you do it to the disciples now after the resurrection, okay, you still don't get it, I'll do it. You do it. Whatever you lose on earth, right? Next week, we're going to talk about um, the dangers of a Jesusless gospel, right? So don't ever hear anything coming from me 
or anybody, there's a Jesusless gospel. There is not. So never hear when we talk about authority that we're taking as a son of the most high God, it is not by the blood of the lamb. Don't hear that. We are, yeah, it's really important. We overcome by the blood of the lamb first, by the word of our testimony second, by not loving our lives under the death third. Those, those things, right? And listen where he goes with this. For where two or three are gathered and together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Heaven's perspective on full display. Um, so I'll close with this. Um, I want to, just a couple of points that I want to just ram home on, the, on, on these. One, um, war in our members, in our families, with our children, don't participate in division. Jesus' whole point frequently was you, this dividing line that you think is there is not there. It's not how I view them. It is not us and them. It is only us. Yes? We don't get to decide who's saved and who isn't. I see that nowhere in Scripture. Quit talking about it. I, please don't say to me, they're not saved. I don't want to hear it. Please don't. How do you know that? That's old school religion. I just don't know. Bill said it this best this way. There's about a billion ways to get to Jesus. Got to get to Jesus. Don't hear that. If I come from every perspective that you belong before you believe... My job, according to Daniel 12, is to lead others to righteousness. That means all of us. We get to lead each other to righteousness. My only job to anybody who's living on the outside, who's living in a pigsty, who's a prodigal son, not a prodigal orphan, is to help lead him out of the pigsty as a son, not an orphan. I don't make that call. It's not my call. I've lived in a pigsty. I didn't like it when people t treated me like I was a pig. I liked it when people saw when I was in a pigsty that I was hurting. My prayer when I was in a pigsty was Jesus. Don't, how, how you judge me? I'm crying on the name of Jesus, you're judging me? I'm speaking for them. These kids that wear F God on their shirts that I matter. Why do you think they say that? Because they've had people represent God put them down. You don't look like me, act like me, walk like me, talk like me. You're not in my club. I have my parties with the popular people, but you're not invited to my parties. I would challenge us also to have parties and broaden the invitation list. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I'm glad I trust God. Holy smokes, man. I love this. Um, I love this. I love, what's that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I see all kinds of logistical things going on, and I got to look at heaven's perspective. Okay, God, you can helicopter in bathrooms. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to handle that. Man, this is my, this is just such a, you guys, man, I, the word I just kept having during worship is beautiful, man. I mean, right down the line, man, I loved worshiping with you tonight. That was, dude, you had me teared up over there. That was great. Thank you. You raised the elevation, you raised the, the room to a height, man. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Man, you come out on a Sunday night. Father, I just, um, just in humility, Father God. Father, we just cast off any division. Division, we bind you in Jesus' name. Unity, in Jesus' name, we loose you in the house. Father, 
Father, the, 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 we just embrace your scripture that says we don't live by what is seen, by what is unseen. Father, I pray stress. Huh. No. Nope. Ooh. Did you catch that? What was I going to say? Yeah. What's Yeah. In Jesus' name, stress, I bind you. Spirit of truth, release you. Father, I just ask you to bind us together in love, gentleness, kindness. Lord, passion, courage, and boldness. Jesus, you certainly weren't a wuss. Can I say that? Love you. In Jesus' name, amen.